Hey, what's up, Grand School? This is Characters. I would like to welcome you to the start of the official start of my new series, which is called Whack a Fish, starring my student Argos, otherwise known as Joe. He's here with me today. Do you want to say hello to the Grand School audience? What's up, guys? So, yeah, this is Joe, and we've been working together for a while now. I've chosen him to be my student for a few reasons that I'll get him to explain um, in a minute for this series. Uh, as you can see from this cartoon here, the main theme is whack -a fish You've got like the little fish popping up here in the amusement arcade, and the carrot man has been inverted from orange on green to green on orange because, or the other way around, because this is the coaching carrot man. He's different from the one that's playing poker, maybe, or something like that. I just thought it was time for a change, so I thought I would just invert the carrot man. Um, yeah, so why don't you tell everyone a bit about what this series is going to be about, Joe, and a little bit about yourself and what you've been doing in your poker career so far. And why is it called whack -a fish Let's start there. Well, it's called whack -a fish because you made up the title. <laughs> <laughs> yep. um, the site that I play at is sort of an anomaly right now in the world of poker in that um, I'm playing in, in New Jersey and in the States, and there happens to be a very soft uh, field right now. So uh, there's a lot of fish, uh, even at the level that I play. I'm playing at 50 NL right now. Um, you know, elsewhere in the world, uh, that would probably equivalent would be 200 NL. I, I'm, I'm, you know, the opposite, you know, you could play 100, 200 NL in New Jersey would be the equivalent of, of, you know, 10 NL in, uh, probably, you know, playing elsewhere in the world. So I have an opportunity right now where there's a lot of fish on the site. It hasn't really caught on yet. It hasn't been opened up to the rest of the States. So, um, I sought out some coaching, uh, you know, with uh, characters, and uh, I've played poker for a while. I played live for many years. Uh, before uh, Black Friday, I played, you know, half a million to a million hands uh, back back in the old full tilt days. Uh, so I've been around. I've sort of been a uh, break even, you know, maybe you know one or two BB either way uh, player. I'm never that serious, but uh, I have an opportunity right now. Given the sites are soft, um, I think to really get in there and, and move up in stakes and, and actually uh, make some some pocket change. Um, so sought out characters, and uh, you know he's helped my game out. And and I think what we've really focused on right now initially is working on the the back end of my game or the back end of the uh, inchworm yeah. as opposed to the front end. Uh, you know, listening to the videos and, and the inchworm concept, uh, there's a lot of leaks that I was making. Um, and so he saw what I was doing. Um, and, and I guess my game is, is, has to be tailored different, you know, which is a good thing about having a coach rather than just watching videos. You know, you're watching videos, it, it can apply to everyone. So seeking out a private coach, he saw readily right on that his normal coaching concept for someone, say, in Australia or the UK, is going to be very different for me because my game is full of fish. Right. So thus, thus the whack of fish series <laughs> is that we that one of the first thing is plug Joe's leaks and then let's concentrate on beating the fish at least at this level. So that's that's where we're at right now. Yep. Cool. So, so yeah, I think that's a pretty good description of of what's happened so far. In a minute, we're gonna look at your screen on or film your screen instead of mine and we're going to have a look at some results and what's changed and you can tell everyone like sort of best that we've got the visual aid I think while we do that you can look at some graphs and stuff like that and you can tell everybody um, what's changed but just before we do that yeah I think that's a really good point that you made that right now you have a good opportunity and it's interesting I think to make this series because quite often we focus very heavily these days on how to beat regs and how to construct ranges and how to play close to theoretically perfectly against your population and stuff like that and when you're playing fish what you need to do is just be like maximally exploitable maximally exploitable and just sort of value betting lots and lots and lots and lots and not sort of splashing out and getting out of line too much not trying to generate fold equity where there is none right so that's kind of what we've been doing so why don't i leave this lovely cartoon it just pains me to leave it because i just made it and i'm like still enjoying it, savoring the, the lovely <laughs> colors on screen as always um but I think we should go over to your screen now, which I can now, which I can now see. I just have a picture of myself and my girlfriend on there just now, so maybe we should bring up a graph and have something a bit more poker-related 
for everyone to look at. That's a kilt, by the way, that I'm wearing there. It's like the Scottish dress. We don't wear them. No, it's not a dress. No, we don't wear them all the time. It was a wedding. And, yeah, you can make fun of me for wearing a skirt. Anyway. So, here we is, have... is, it, is it true that true Scotsmen <laughs> don't wear anything underneath? Is Yeah, I guess that's traditionally the way it was, right? Because you didn't bother with like, different layers of clothing. You just had a layer of clothing, right? So, back in the day, yes. So, if you want to still be traditional, sure. But most people, I think, if you went to a wedding, you went around and lifted up everyone's kilts, you'd only find about 10-15% of them were true Scotsmen, as you put it. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so here we have a graph. Um... And we can sort of, this is like one of these, is this the, this is so, like the full graph, yeah, from like before we started making lots well, of adjustments, right? Well, this is actually when I first started uh, coaching with characters. So this is, uh, you know, we, we've got 17,000 hands here. So we started here, um, and this has been over, what, a few months right now? Um, yeah, a month or two, maybe. Yeah, a couple months, long, yeah. and this kind of shows uh, post, you know, pre, I could show you pre that, and then uh, post that, but this is, um, do you want me to go into it a little bit, or what I know about it, or? Yeah, I mean, the thing to, the main, okay, what's the most striking thing that's basically going on here, like, when we first started, before we'd had time to get you to implement too many changes in your game, um, you can see that. I mean, the start of this graph is basically like as soon as we started coaching. So it basically does right. show pretty much how you were playing before because things didn't like snap change for you overnight. It doesn't quite Correct. work that way, right, with coaching. No one's a miracle worker instantaneously. Um, so I think the start of this graph kind of shows like the way, although it is a kind of small sample, the red and blue lines are still relatively accurate over this kind of sample and show the way that you were sort of playing. So... Why don't right, you take everyone through like what kind of change you can see, like the red line and the blue line, and then the kind of switch. So talk people through, right. I guess, why that happened and what you changed to make that happen, and what I kind of said to you, what we, what goals we set you to make you make that change happen. Okay, so my game has been generally pretty an ag aggressive aggro game. Um, how did that get up there? Um, and it just wasn't working against these fish. Um, you can see here, you know, I, I was bluffing a lot. I, I guess the red translates to, you know, winning, you know, it's non showdown winnings. So these winnings, the, the more they would go up, the more my blue line would go down. And thus, you know, my overall cash winnings were, were hurting. So right around here, you can see there's a, an acute decision where I got a good tongue lashing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, it was very acute. You can see it. Um, I, I, I was having a lot of aggro tilt and, and, and uh, sort of this, uh, I, I guess, uh, characters called it a vendetta, where when people would three bet me, say, from the small blind and I'm on the button, I would four bet, just, just spew and go after them. Meanwhile, they're fish, and they probably actually had a real hand. So um, my default was to play back at them, and then I was getting owned quite a bit. So he just had me take that crap out of my game and just uh, tone it down, tone down the, uh, you know, the vendetta stuff, and, you know, value bet the fish. Uh, and one of the other things was uh, we, we talked about isolating fish larger pre-flop I guess there was three or four things one was isolating fish uh, pre-flop larger than I was before mm -hmm. uh, two we talked about on the button uh, with my steals going to 2x versus uh, three sort of a min raise if we had regs yep. in in both lines which rarely happens with my games. Yep. Uh, so most of the times it's three X's and sometimes if they're really big fish, sometimes they'll even go more. Right. Um, and then we talked about um, not going crazy with my draws, which is one of the things I'm incorporating now. Before, let's say I had a flush draw, a non-nut flush draw on the flop, I would be check raising with that or I would be betting three quarters pot. Right now I'm – my default is going to be check call or maybe bet out half pot. So it's been toned down quite a bit. Uh, so basically wait till I hit the big hand and then value bet like crazy. Right. Um, and so those are the big changes. I, I'm still 
find myself calling down um, maybe more than I should. Maybe that that's one of the areas I need to improve. But you can see right here, there's a huge change mentally in my game and technically. Yeah. Uh, that as soon as I did that, you know, the red line just the the two inversed. They they just reversed. Uh, and as a result, uh, you know, the green line, the money line has, you know, sort of jumped above the page uh, and, and made a big difference in my results. And it's a sh small sample, as we said, but it's, I, I think it is significant and that, that it's real data. So, yep. And that's the other thing that I was saying to you before was that when you're playing a game that has slightly less variance, okay, why does it have less variance? Because it's so fishy that if you play optimally against these players as you are now, um, you're actually generating quite a big edge. And the bigger the edge you have, the less variance is going to matter, right? Like if you sit down in a casino where you have like, and you play like some horrible rigged casino game where you have like a minus 8% edge or something, you're going to just get killed like really quickly there. However, if you sit down and you have like a, a much smaller edge, it's going to take ages for that negative variance to like hit you. And this is the same thing in poker. Like if you only have a small edge, you can lose a lot in the, the short run, basically even if you're winning overall. But when you have a bigger edge, because your games are full of fish, um, sample like 17,000 hands, you're way less likely to sort of have a, a losing streak over that sample um, because the variance is so much less, because your edge is so much bigger. So yeah, this is definitely like more meaningful than it would be in at 50 NL on stars or full tilt or something like that, basically. Right. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so it's interesting here that what we want when we're playing against fish then is that we want the blue line to be really, really healthy because fish don't fold. That's the thing. So sort of spewing against these bad regs and these fish and trying to go for fold equity where there isn't really any was like your biggest leak. Um, and that was like one of the first things that we had to fix. Um, why don't we talk a bit about... Okay, that's, that's the results. That's what happened. But what were our coaching sessions actually like? Like why don't, you, why don't we talk about like what we actually did to find these leaks and to sort of fix them? What formats did we use? Did we just sit and play poker and say, oh, um, you should raise actually, here, or what did we do? We didn't, we didn't play any poker until probably the fourth or fifth session, which mm -hmm. is probably right in here. This is where you actually watched what I was was doing some of it. And in here, we talked a bit of theory, a bit about my history. Um, we pulled up some hand histories and reviewed those. Um, and... Um, I, I specifically like reviewing the hand histories, um, you know, trouble spots. We, we didn't concentrate on just the, the big hands that I would lose. I think you talked about on your videos and with me on concentrating on common spots that keep yeah. coming up and recurring over and over again. Mm -hmm. So if we plug that leak, I'm going to see that over and over and over again. It might only be a, you know, 20 BB pot versus a hundred, but that's going to happen hundreds or thousands of times. It's going mm -hmm. to make a bigger change in my overall win rate. So that's, so we, we did that. Um, there were some big pots that I was losing due to spew specifically aggro, yeah. you know, vendetta spew. So, uh, we looked at that where I, I think you were cringing. It, the cringing <laughs> is good because it told me how bad it was. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, 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 I told Peter earlier on, I'd be brutally honest with me. And he was, uh, and that if there's a spot that's really, really terrible, uh, just let me know. And, uh, so he did and it, that's good. Um, uh, so a lot of the big, big leaks, uh, playing back at people foolishly mm -hmm. were plugged. Um, now that doesn't mean to say I, I, I don't need to be vigilant in the future of that creeping back into my game, but at least that's under control right now. Uh, and then, uh, I recorded videos of my own. I, I got the recording video uh, software, uh, mm -hmm. Movavi, and um, recorded sessions. Uh, and then we would review uh, the sessions that I played. And, and that actually might even be better than live because you could actually stop at a certain point and review the situation, re rewind it, go back. So it's sort of a hybrid, I guess, of playing live. You know, it, it's better than just reviewing a hand history. Mm -hmm. And, it, you know, it, it, it's sort of a cross between a live play and a hand history. Uh, and I like that. So you can stop, review it, go forward. You, you can also get a feel for the metagame as well, which you really can't from the hand history. Yeah. Um, so uh, that I, 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 I uh, took a lot out of 
uh, and I'm tagging a lot of my hands. Uh, I'm using Poker Tracker 4, and I tag hands uh, after each session I play, yeah. um, and I'll, I'll actually tag them in game and then review my tagged hands afterwards. And if there's anyone's, I'll make notes uh, based on what I thought of. I should have done in a certain situation. Mm -hmm. Let's say I should have folded here. I should have, you know, I did this, and I'll make my own analysis. And then when I have a session uh, with characters, I'll ask him if he thought my, you know, I'll say, yeah, I know I I screwed up in game, but here's what I did post game. Did I figure it out correctly? And you know, maybe three quarters of the time he'll say, yeah, that was right. You should have folded here, but the real benefit to me is when I don't even know that I don't know when. I think that I made the right move even post analysis. And he says, no, for some reason, this is wrong. This was spew or you could have gotten more value here. Um, and that to me is where the, the, the light bulb goes on. That's where the, where, you know, some, somebody tells me and, and he gives me the reasons behind it. Um, why such move uh, makes sense uh, logically you know, uh, in game. So that, that has been very beneficial for me. Yeah. Good. I think that's like definitely something that's worth letting the ground school audience know about is that there are like lots of different formats of sessions and you're not just necessarily sitting doing a sweat or just endlessly reviewing hand histories for one hour and then stopping. And um, rather what we're doing is we're using different sessions, depending on what we're trying to achieve that day, depending on what we're trying to achieve overall and kind of what we're aiming at in the overall sort of program. Um, like you guys saw last time when we're doing coaching, I'm not just, I'm not just like blindly going from session to session, but there are goals in between, right? There are always things that we're working on. So if we're working on your, you not spewing in big pots, then I'm telling you to tag all the big pots in between this session and the next session. And then we're going to look at those next time. Here's a big pot that I played and I didn't spew here. Great. And we're sort of like getting you to, to mark out the very types of situation that we're looking to fix. Um, in between those sessions so very much it's quite goal sort of orientated right like in between sessions you've always got goals to be working on and you've got directed learning and I think that's like really important because then you actually you're aware of what you're trying to fix and you've got direction and that's like one of the big things probably one of the biggest things about hiring a coach is just having that direction and having your leaks found quickly and efficiently and then being told how you can plug those and what you should do on your own in independent study time to plug them. Like the things that you gain out of coaching are not just the very, the coaching time itself. It's not just like that one or two hours a week where you're actually sitting with your coach. It's having the direction in between sessions, right? Is that quite important for you? Like knowing what you should work on, knowing where you should direct your attention, I guess. Yeah, that was a question. Was that, did you find that you had, like, <laughs> sorry, I didn't make that too clear. Maybe you just, we can talk about, about yeah, what direction uh, you had. I, in I, I didn't know if you were done with the question. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 absolutely. I mean, I, I really think that, um, you know, I, what I'm doing is I, I, I record our sessions. So uh, immediately after we have a session, if I have time, I'll review that session. And then maybe once or twice during the week, I'll play back uh, our our Skype session, um, whether it's the video or the audio. You know, I could review it even in my car when I'm driving. I'll listen to the audio, uh, and it might take me a couple of times to really sink mm -hmm. in a couple of things, <laughs> especially when you were on me about the the uh, the Vedetta stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I played that like at least three or four times, and, and, I, and I really sunk in. And then, you know, specifically certain spots as well. Um, you know, the, the difference, uh, you know, we, we talked about specific types of fish. Are, are they fit or fold fish mm -hmm. or which, which I, I hopefully we'll get into in the series, you know, Definitely. to For finding sure. different types of fish. But that's one of the things that hit me as well. You know, not all fish are the same. Is this, is this a, a fish that's just going to be a calling station or are they a fit or fold fish? So, uh, I really started to process that information in between our sessions and then actually started tagging them differently in, in my, uh, you know, tagging software and in my HUD. So now I'm delving even in deeper, uh, learning how to handle 
which fish are which. And that happens between the sessions, obviously. And it's going to happen on my review. Okay, maybe with this fish, you know, you know, I just need to value bet the hell out of him. This fish is fitter fold, so I'm going to see bet against him more. Yep. You know, so um, that's that's sort of the revelation that's yep. uh, revelation that's happening. Yeah, you know? revelations are definitely good. Revelations are <laughs> even better sometimes. Yeah, we we sent you away, didn't, didn't we, with like goals of think about the player type and completely change up your game based on that because you're playing in a game. This whack of a series is all about this really unique game, this New Jersey um, party poker. It's party poker, isn't it? That you yeah. Play out in New Jersey, yeah. This this weird and small player pool that has some regs and then it has absolute whales. And, I mean, you're talking about you really need to be able to identify, not just between the regs and the whales, but between the types of whales and the severity of whales and the types of fish. So, yeah, you were sent away in between sessions always with the with the sort of goal of, tagging and identifying and then working out what kind of um, strategy we're going to play against each. Um, against like the fitter fold guys, we introduced the notion of sort of isolating really big to make sure we got them through ourselves and build a pot. And then see betting with a huge frequency and a huge success rate because they were fair or fold. Against those splasher guys, we talked about what you were mentioning earlier, not going berserk with semi-bluffs, rather sort of keeping pots a little bit smaller, although still building some kind of pot when we've got a good draw. But keeping them a bit smaller, not getting all in on the flop anymore, just trying to hit our hand and then shoveling immense amounts of money into the pot because they're not folding anyway, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so yeah, player typing was definitely one of your goals. Um, and do you remember I set you two goals as well? Um, maybe you should ex we can explain to the viewers the difference between your mental game and your technical game and how they're both very important things to go working on in between coaching sessions and the sort of difference between those two parts. What was your... Maybe start with this thing, we call it Vendetta. This was your mental game leak. Um, your technical game leak was more just sort of bad spot selection, I suppose. What was the difference between those and how did like we break up that distinction and make it clear that you had these two separate problems? Um, I, I, I don't think you... The good part was that you addressed them separately and yeah. not try to uh, commingle it. Uh, right. and kind of clearly separated it out. I mean, we went through some basic poker math that, um, yeah, I, I kind of was okay on, but I needed to brush up on. So, you know, we went through, uh, you know, bet divided by bet plus pot, mm -hmm. and we talked about how much equity you needed uh, for your bluff to work versus how much uh, equity you needed to call in certain situations. Yeah. So we brushed up the technical aspect, mm -hmm. which, you know, I, I – I could always improve on. I wasn't great on that. Um, and it, it's basic poker math, but I, I did need that. Um, and just very quickly, like there's a bit more as well to the technical aspect than just the math. I mean, like the putting your opponents on a range of hands and figuring oh, out. Like, yeah, 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 of course. But yeah. I mean, that's where we started. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that was the, the beginning of it, mm -hmm. uh, technical end. And then, you know, sort of, uh, putting players on ranges and, and trying to figure out, um, based on my range where his range is going to be. So some of that was, uh, I, I was clueless to as, as far as playing ranges. Yeah. I, I would know if a nit was under the gun that he's playing ace king and jacks plus most of the time. But when players got closer to the button, uh, and they have real wide ranges, you know, a, a V pip of 60, which I commonly see with, you know, uh, you know, and, and, and they're, they're raising on the button 50%. Uh, it's not so easy anymore. So we <laughs> starting to cover some of that, which would be the front end, I guess, of the inchworm to try to really, um, th that would be the technical aspect to try to hone that in. And I, I think as we go forward, that's going to be, one of the areas that we're going to focus on as well. Um, and, and then the mental game, I guess is totally separate just to really, uh, I, I guess, uh, Peter didn't know initially, you know, how my mental game was until he actually saw me playing or, or saw what I did uh, on my videos. Mm -hmm. And then he could clearly see, aha, <laughs> here, I, I can see that you're spewing here. And actually, if you look at my graph, 
that's when I, you know, I guess you recognize that there was a mental game aspect of, of it too, yep. that, um, and so you combine taking the crap out of the game, the, the, the mental spew, mm -hmm. and then making some technical changes as far as bet sizing, yep. uh, pre-flop with isolations and then post-flop, um, you know, we, we talked about, you know, on my C bets, maybe going uh, half pot versus three quarters all the time, um, you know, the, saving a lot of money that way. Yeah. Um, so I guess we talked about them separately, the technical and the mental, and then mm -hmm. you brought them together in game, which was good. Um, so it, it, it made more sense to me that way. It, it sunk in. Yeah. Uh, I guess you're, you're a teacher, right? You teach... Uh, language as well so yeah uh, he, he's a very good teacher so able to um teach the things separately and then, then bring them together later i think that's a good art for a teacher yeah yeah well yeah, done. i think <laughs> thanks joe i think these two things are like really um important to separate and people tend to not separate them so that was one of the most enlightening things for us i think during our sessions is that we were able to say okay you're doing a lot of technical things wrong but your technical game isn't actually that bad your technical game is okay, but then it falls completely apart because your mental game gets in the way and you've got this huge mental game leak that we later dubbed as Vendetta. In just a minute, I'll get you to just quickly explain exactly what that was. There are all different kinds of mental game leaks that people have when they come to me, but when we do coaching, it's not just about fixing the technical stuff and showing people how to put their opponents on a range and how to size their bets and how to construct three-bet ranges. It's also about, as a coach, like... Your job as well is to make sure that people's mental game is okay and to make sure that they're thinking about poker in a, a logical way and their sort of emotions aren't getting in the way or they're not becoming irrational because of a mental game issue. So, yeah, we realized that even though your technical game wasn't too bad, this mental game leak known as Vendetta, this is like a new thing that we came up with. It wasn't like a, this isn't like an existing common leak or anything, but it does exist. It is something I've seen before. But because of this kind of Vendetta thought process, this mental game leak, the actual green line here was just getting killed because this red line is like soaring at the start here because of this leak. Um, before we'd managed to eradicate it, you were still sort of picking really kind of strange spots to decide that your opponent had a very was messing with you or had a really weak range or that you should just bring the hammer down upon his head regardless of what your whole cards were and what was going on and just try to kill him basically, right? So this is what Vendetta was. Um, yeah. What did we do to defuse Vendetta? How did we stop that from... Well, we can see uh, that we clearly did here because you started folding a hell of a lot more. This red line is steeply declining here. Um, a little bit too steeply? Right, it has, it maybe for now, but as we work on the technical stuff and we get you playing better in smaller pots, this will level out and it won't decline that much. And that means that the blue line that's now restored back to full health will be able to make that green line even better. So the red line is going in the right direction now, even though it's losing. That's absolutely the right direction. It should be losing in a game full of fish. We've stopped you spewing in all these weird spots. So, yeah, how did we get you to stop that? What were you doing initially, basically? Talk us through the old mental game, Joe, and the things that you were doing when you had this leak, and then what did we do to change to fix it, basically? Um, well, I, I think in a lot of spots, um, when people, when players would play back at me, um, without clearly analyzing it analytically, I would assume that people were just picking me out and playing back at me. When And when we really went back and looked at it, we would see that the guy's got a three bet of, of like three or four percent. Right. And that <laughs> you said the guy is, is not actually even messing with you. So I, you know, I, I was thinking that players were messing with me who really weren't, who probably had an actual, you know, e e even fish hit a good hand every now and then. And, um, you know, some of these, you know, players will very small aggression factor. Um, and I was taking it that, you know, this, this person is playing back at me now and I'm going to four bet them light. And, um, so I was shown that, you know, look, let the data speak for itself. Look, look at the stats. That this person really wasn't even messing with you, and and you, and you just blew a stack off. Right, but it's an irrational <laughs> thing, right? It's not that you're trying to logically deduce what's going on, and just your logic is bad. It's not that. It's just that this mental game leak is getting in the way of free logic. It's getting in the way of actually deducing things properly. 
And that's what mental game leaks are. There are encumbrances to you being able to use your technical game. And I know so many of my students come to me with big mental game leaks and they need to be fixed before you can have a green line that's positive. They need to be fixed. Um, so yeah, Vendetta was a nice example of one of those and it was definitely one that I've seen before. Um, maybe that applies to a lot of you guys out there as well. Um, but there are lots of mental game leaks like that that we work on. And Joel will have some more as well that we've not yet found or we've not yet um, tried to focus on because we don't want to focus on everything all at once. But the point is that we focus on the thing that's most important, the thing that's like crushing your win rate, and we get rid of that first so you can start to have some success and then we can look at the, the things that are affecting it to a smaller, to a lesser extent. So yeah, that's what we're kind of, what, that's what we've done here. We've basically found that we had this big leak and it was the fundamental problem of this game. We fixed that and now we're looking forward to the front end of the inchworm, I guess, and we're like adding things to your technical game and getting you to play more optimally. And as we do that, that red line will level out a little bit. And I would expect that in a few weeks when we, as long as you don't go on a big tilt epidemic and make me look bad then we'll be fine and the red line will be even better and the blue line will be even better so we're going in the right the right direction now so yeah cool so that was a little overview of what we've been doing so far a little introduction to joe's game since we're going to be doing a good few episodes together you want to get to know what what he's like so we can sort of see how he goes from here um so what we're going to do in this series is just follow his progress each time we do an episode we're going to talk about maybe we'll take steps of this one because this was like the introductory episode but we're going to talk about what Joe's goals are for that week and what we've been looking at, what we've set for him because it's directed learning. There are mental game goals, there are technical game goals and they do come together in your results and in your play but they're addressed separately like Joe was saying. Um, so we're always going to outline what his goals are just like I showed you guys in the last episode of the introductory episode of this series where we looked at the types of goals I've been setting for all of my different students. We're going to do that with Joe's game and have some directed learning and see how he progresses from there. So it should be fun, exciting series, right? We should have a good time here. Yeah. Um, and yeah, why don't we get into it? We don't have too long left for today, but why don't we bring up the video that you've recorded recently and you can go through it and we'll just look at your, your play and you can tell me what you think about it. And we'll show, show people how we would do this recorded video review. Um, it's not as simple as just play the video and talk. Um, there's a method to it, right? Like instead of um, me just ranting at Joe the whole time, that doesn't help. You want your student to be um, involved in the learning and making the decisions and making the mistakes so that when he makes mistakes, they can be corrected, not just passively sitting and absorbing stuff. So what I get you to do, right, is I get you to speak about the hands first and what you think you did and why. And then, only then when I've heard you articulate your thoughts, do I sort of intervene and give you some guidance? Because it's very important that you keep practicing under supervision the the skill of analyzing your own game because that's just so important. So why don't we get into the video and we'll do that, right? Okay, yeah. We haven't reviewed this before, so this is the no. first time. First time I am seeing it. Yes, seeing it. Spots, absolutely. So this is four tables of uh, 50 and L. Um, right. Um, I guess pretty, I forget what time of day this was, but pretty standard. Uh, now let's just take a minute to look around these tables. If you look at the HUD there, let's go through the first. Joe's HUD's a little bit different to most people's in it. The VPIP PFR is actually on the second line. So it's this middle line here. Um, and Do you want me to pause it? Uh, yeah, let's pause it just while we, while we look at the HUD, yeah. So let's go through the HUD just really quickly for everyone. Okay. So, um, I have, uh, you know, I have a yellow, a, a green box around, which is tagged as a fish. It, this is the poker tracker, uh, HUD and I can tag them there as a fish. Then in on the software itself, um, I can tag as well. So this guy's got a plus, which is sort of a super fish, yep. uh, like a whale. A whale, exactly. Uh, so I've got hands mm -hmm. 436. Uh, I've got. Uh, steel, mm -hmm. uh, full to steel, mm -hmm. uh, VPIP, yeah. uh, 51, PFR. Uh, this is aggression factor. Mm -hmm. uh, uh. Here, it, this guy doesn't have anything here, but this is a stat that I really don't use right now, but that's sort of fold uh, to – don't worry about that one now. Uh, <laughs> and then on the, the third line, we have three bet, uh, full to three bet, mm -hmm. C bet, and uh, fold to C bet. Yeah. This one is fold to 
seabed after in a three bed pot mm-hmm. afterwards something like that again that one and this other one we, I don't use too often but here's our main line here that I'm using is the V pip uh, PFR and then the three bed stats here yeah. so focusing on that middle line of V pip and PFR if we glance yeah. around here at this typical day in the life of Joe the New Jersey grinder you're gonna see just what these games look like and most of you guys that are playing on stars and full tilt right now are probably you're probably like your keyboard is probably broken because you've just drooled and salivated all over it just by looking at this HUD. You're not used to seeing this, right? We have fish everywhere. Look yeah, at this. We've got one here. Uh, on table one, we've got this guy, this guy. On yeah. table two, we've got one, two, three. On table two, and then over here, we've got one. Yeah. Multiple fish everywhere. Two here. And then here, we've got one. This is eh, yeah, two. Yeah, he's still a fish, yeah. Three. We've got three, you know, two to three at every table. Yeah, and this got is four actually, there at table four. Yeah, we've got loads. Yeah. You know, so oh, no, that's is, you. That's you over like four hands. It's running 50, 25. That's not a fish. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's a big fish. It's <laughs> <laughs> so like the point is that these games are ridiculously soft, and that's why it's whack fish and that's why we're going to be looking at exactly how to maximize our EV against fish in this series predominantly. And that's not just like as simple as value bet, value bet, value bet. It's things like what ranges do you ISO with against different kinds of fish pre-flop? What ranges do you see bet against different kinds of fish pre-flop, uh, a post-flop? It's hard to see bet pre-flop. Um, stuff like that. So let's take this guy that you used, this bad luck spider whale plus guy on table three, it's the tarantula picture. Um, what kind of fish is he, Joe? Talk us through um, what kind of fish. Is he like a fit or fold fish or is he a crazy never folding fish? And how are you going to play against him based on that, based on what we've learned so far? All right, so, so he's... Pretty much a standard fit or fold fish because yep. I look at his stats here. Obviously, he's calling a lot pre-flop. Um, and then post-flop to three bets, he's got a 91% uh, fold to three bets. And he's got a 67% fold to C, uh, to C bets. So mm-hmm. they're both in the blue, which for me are, are knit stats. That means you fold a lot. Yep. Uh, if it showed up yellow down here, that means he wouldn't be folding a lot. He'd calling a lot and he's not folding a lot. Then he would be sort of a calling station. So mm-hmm. he's the opposite. Yep. He calls a lot. Uh, he's fit or fold. Uh, so with someone like this, I'm going to really make him pay the price. I'm going to really try to isolate this guy pre-flop, especially yep. if I'm in the seat uh, right to his left. It's perfect. Jesus so. seat, they call it. Yeah, this is like yeah. the absolute yeah. best seat at the table. This guy is like the kind of fish who is just a dream because – Right. While his, his VPEP is like through the roof and he's just playing awfully with hand selection, he's also not giving you any kind of stress for it. He's just giving up when he doesn't have right. anything and probably stacking off the top pair when he has that. So yep. this guy is a dream come true. That's why he's listed as a super fish here. Um, so, yeah, and being uh, – he's this guy's going to limp a ton. Yeah. Uh, I mean, 51% of the hand. He's only got a, a PFR of four. So, I mean, probably, what, 48% of the time of, of hands, this guy's limping in. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I'm just going to isolate him big. Yep. And, um, you know, I'm going to see bet against this guy um, all, with my, almost all my range. Yep. Um, and uh, just take it down right there. Um, and, and then when I, you know, get value... Um, you know, I'm going to value bet him like crazy as well. So he's probably the easiest type of fish to play against. Definitely. He's like the one we really want to see. And how does that... Let's talk about hand selection preflop when we isolate. Um, like we said, with this guy, we can isolate like seriously, seriously wide. Because what are we looking for in order to isolate? What do we want to be able to have? Do we just want to be able to like make a strong hand? No, we need other things too. We need fold equity. And against this guy, we have it in spades. But one thing that we've been looking at recently is that we need to be a bit careful when there are lots of fish behind us. What's the danger of isolating? In theory, we'd like to isolate this bad luck guy with four or two suited every time just because he folds on the flop so often that it's going to be good for us even when we flop four high a lot. But why is that a problem when we have all these guys behind us, these whales with high defense? If we get this other fish behind us here on the button in Mm -hmm. this case, uh, you know, so if I'm isolating too light, this guy's going to come along mm-hmm. and then maybe even now this guy who's not even a fish has got pot odds to call. So now I've got a four way multi-way pot mm-hmm. with, with a lousy hole, you know, with a very weak range. Right. Uh, so and why is that problem multi-way? Why is that such a bigger problem multi-way to have a weak range on the flop? Well, I can't, it, it takes out all my fold equity, right. uh, 
you know, so I, I have no fold equity, multi-way, um, and, and really that's where my money is going to come from when exactly. I'm see betting light is going to be from fold equity, right? And I have, you know, every, every person that comes in, it goes down exponentially, my, my fold equity, so. Indeed. Yeah, good, good answer. So, yeah, that's exactly it. We're looking to, you're still there, aren't you? I thought the yeah, comment yeah, yeah, Okay, I'm good. Um, yeah, we're looking to basically maximize fold equity. So when we just have one of these dudes, we want to isolate him really wide, but we do need to be careful when we have multiple fish at the table. And if bad luck here, the guy to our right was one of these fish that never folds on the flop, then what are we going to do? Are we going to isolate four dudes off or what kind of range are we going to favor? Um, big broadways, yeah. uh, pocket pairs. Um, yeah, flopping uh, sets against people that don't fold right. is nice. Uh -huh. Suited aces. Mm -hmm. um, that's, you know... Yeah. Pretty much uh, things that that uh, are going to have uh, good showdown value. Uh, that, yeah, things that are going to flop a hand that we can value bet more often. Four right. soft suit will sometimes, or four to suited will sometimes flop a hand that we can value bet because it's like the nuts, because it's like trip fours or a flush or a straight. But a hand like King Jack will flop a hand that we can value bet for three streets lots more frequently. So flop top pair, and it's much easier to flop one pair than it is to flop the nuts. So yeah, against the guys that don't fold, we favor those kind of ranges pre-flop to ISO with. And the same goes when we've got this like table with four fish where we're just not getting it heads up enough. But when we can get it heads up against bad luck, we just go absolutely ballistic and we start isolating like close to any two cards. What about this high three bets that? How do we exploit a guy that's got 91% three bet and also folds the C bets all the time? What should we do? Uh, are you talking about a specific guy here? Or? Yeah, let's stay with the spider, Mr. Plus Spider. What are we going to do? Okay, um, so fold to three bet, it really depends on what we have. I mean, if, if I have a um, if I have a lousy holding, you know, I want to three bet like crazy, but if I have a value hand, I don't, I, I might want to keep this guy in more. Yeah. Right, so um, if I if I think I'm ahead of his range, mm -hmm. um, I want to I want to bring him along. So I mean, that's very very rarely will I see like a 91. Yeah, this is weird. Seven. Like this is a very strange type of player. So this is like most fish, but who are 51 four will call three bets like all right. the time. But this guy has some kind of phobia of right. three bets. And, and it, it, it's a decent sample size too. I mean, I got right. 400 hands on the guy, so. Yeah. Um, so yeah, if fish. it was fifty hands, I wouldn't. I wouldn't pay much attention to yeah, it. But as you shouldn't. Good. Yeah. So um, yeah, I mean that's this guy. I could almost reading you know what to do with him face up uh, for most most of the time. Definitely. Uh, so we're three bet bluffing like a lot against him because he's just we should be polarized. We should be like, three bet bluffing loads, and then we should be like considering even flatting hands like aces just because he's such a strange type of player. He's like folding so frequently to three bets that we should consider just not three betting with the nuts because he's going to fold like almost eighteen times, nineteen times, and twenty. Right. right. So that's just that. Bad. That would be only blind versus blind, right? It, you know, I'm not flatting aces if there's other people behind. Obviously. Yeah, yeah. So if, yeah, if, if he's uh, small blind, I'm big blind. You know, you know, I, I could flat aces there against this guy. Um, that would be the rare situation for that. Correct. It's weird though because one thing is that. Most of the time, this guy faces a three bet. Now, here's where you need to be kind of careful where you need to take stat interpretation to the next level, right? While this guy is folding to three bets loads of the time, when he's limped, like most of the time this guy folds to three bet, he won't have opened, he'll have limped, and then someone will have three bet, and then he'll fold, right? But right. what about the times when he opens himself? He's only got a 4% PFR. Is he folding 91% when he's actually opened? Well... I can't pull up all the other stats, but I mean, he because we're in the video here. But I mean, he's only got a one as far as aggression factor, so he's um, he's he's very passive. So when he passive. raises pre-flop, he has a strong range, right? Yes. So he's yeah. probably not going to fold ninety percent of that. So I think that we can actually three bet him when he opens, and it wouldn't be bad to like three bet aces for value against him because while he will fold a lot when he limps. To oh, a oh, I see. So, so you're going to put him on a very strong range yeah. then. So he's he's going to have you know. So let's say I wouldn't want to do that with queens. Um, it might be, be, let's maybe say not, maybe not. He, he's under the gun. Yeah. And raises. Yeah. You know, let's say I'm I'm in middle. He's under the gun. He raises with queens here. I, I mean, he he raises under the gun, and I let's say jacks. I have jacks. Mm -hmm. I know he's 
pre-flop raising very, very small percentage of your time, 4%. Yep. So my jacks aren't doing so good. You no. know, I might not want a three bet. No. Like, it's probably a flat. Right, exactly. So we can't three bet for value. Good. So with a hand like jacks, we need to be like really careful against this kind of guy because he just doesn't have many weaker hands in his pre-flop opening range, which means that this fold to three bet number comes from the fact that he just limps and then never cold calls three bets. But it does give you information because it means he doesn't cold call three bets very much, which means that we don't need to worry about him coming along if he's behind us when we're three bet bluffing or something like that because we can three bet bluff a reg. We know this guy is not going to get in our way because he just loves to not interfere with three bets. We just know that he's fair fold in that respect. But when he opens, totally different scenario. Okay, I think we've beaten that to death a bit. Let's play the video. This is just a taster today, an intro session. There will be lots of actual full meted out coaching sessions where we just do a video review for the whole thing and diagnose more leaks, set more goals, that kind of thing. So this is a spot where we ISO fives here. Um, let's pause. We isolate fives and we get this three-way pot. Um, we've got a few fish at this table. When might we want to limp over limp fives here rather than isolating? Uh, when it's multi-way, when mm -hmm. we're deep. Maybe when we're deep. I mean, I don't, if we're deep enough, right, we don't want to be, like, shallow, but we don't think we need to be, like, super deep. But, yeah, when it's multi-way, when we're likely to go multi-way to the flop, because if we ISO fives and get a four-way pot, it's not terrible for us. But, again, the same problem's cropping up that we talked about before, right, that we're going to have to play more fit or fold, and we're not going to flop a set very often, so we're going to have a crappy under pair and not have fold equity. Here, it's not so bad. We do have two fish ahead of us. I would consider just over-limping here. I think it's fine, um, but it depends how often these guys are going to come along. I just think like when you've got a guy with a 65 e-pip behind and another guy that's 32-something, another couple of guys, that you can limp their pre-flop and it's probably okay. better, slightly, just because you just aren't going to have very much fold equity. You're not going to be able to see back because you are going to go through your four way a lot. If you didn't have this massive whale behind you, who's going to come along all the time, then you can just ISO and see back because then you have full deck. Okay, so yeah, it just goes back to what we talked about before. Now, um, what what part of, of uh, pocket pairs would that apply to? Up to like sevens or eights? Yeah. At nines, at nines I would be... Uh, I think... It's, it's hard to say, but I think it's, at eights, you should definitely be raising maybe even at sevens, probably sixes and below. I think sevens are like the kind of crossover yeah. hand and sixes and below are kind of better to limp there probably and eights and above are definitely better to raise there because you just don't need as much fold equity you just connect with flops better you have over pairs more often you have stronger second pairs more often you don't okay. need as much fold equity with eights plus as you do with like fives so i think that does matter for sure okay okay so then on the flop um we go did we see bet flop i don't know what happened no i think i, I, I checked it okay let's just double check what happened on the flop Okay, cool. Yep, so we ISO here. Pretty good spot to limp, I think, just because the small line is going to come along and fold equity is going to be fairly poor. Minimize our investment and give ourselves an amazing implied odds price to flop a set. And then we always have the option of like leading out three times the pot and still getting called by these guys, right? So, but I think isolating here is not too bad either because you do only have like one guy with a huge V pit behind you. It's not like you have like a full table of 65 ones. And we check here because we're three-way. I think that's good. And what's the other reason that we should check here? Like, how good is our hand to see bet and why? Um, our hand is terrible to see bet here. Right. I mean, this really smashes their ranges. Um, you know, uh, you've got flush draws, you've got straight draws, you've got all sorts of broadways, um, you know. Yep, uh, so they're going to hit this a bunch, right? Right. But what yeah. about us having two fives in our hand? How what were our prospects like in future streets when we have two fives? Uh, well, we've got two outs. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> we're not uh, we're not doing so good here. Exactly. So, what kind of hand might we see bet here? What kind of non-made hand might we see bet here? What's a better uh, hand to see bet with? Uh, uh, um, obviously, our flush draws. Mm -hmm. uh, um, any sort of uh, straight draw, draw, straight draws or combo draws. So we can have mm -hmm. any one of these. You know. Ace, nine, jack, ace, x. Uh, so any sort of uh, even even bottom pair here, you yeah. know, even nine x, I probably would consider uh, c betting here. Yeah. Uh, but I, I I don't know. You talked about slowing down a bit. Probably not with a nine x. Like if it, it was nine, uh, well nine eight obviously. Uh, but let's say it was nine seven suited. 
probably would not, seeing that you said, you know, play these slower. Uh, that, that's questionable for me, whether I would do that right now. In the past, I would. If I hit that board, I would just, you know, three-quarter pot, uh, hit that against the fish. Um, yeah, I mean, I think three-way, you shouldn't see about 9x here because you're just going to get called by all better hands and not really many worse hands, although, like, some crappy draws, but they still have good equity against you when you have 9x. So I think we should just try and get the showdown when we have 9x here, um, three-way. We just don't have enough fold equity. But I think heads up, we should see better with, like, 9x because it's just the best way to play. Right, yeah, 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 sure. Yeah. yeah, but like slowing down multi way when we don't have fold equity is important. That's like the thing that you're getting at is that I've told you a lot to slow down when fold equity is not very big and we don't have a very strong hand. Absolutely. Right. That's one of the big things that the last couple sessions we did was that you've told me to focus on when it's multi way versus yeah. heads up, yeah. which I, I, of course, knew in the past, but I wasn't giving it near as much um, weight as I needed to. Yeah, so, uh, absolutely. now when it's multi-way, I'm really cautious about sea bedding, uh, pick my spots. Yeah. Uh, especially when you've got fish at the table yeah. who are stationary, like this guy could well be like, we've got two guys who don't need too much of a piece of this board to continue. So yeah, we check flop, we call this little lead in the turn, we check back river, a nice hand, well played. Um, I like it. Could limp, still prefer a limp pre-flop, but I don't think like your ISO is horrible there or anything. I'd just okay. rather ISO hands like 10 9 suited that flop much better and more frequently and don't need so much fold equity on the flop as fives does. Um, yeah, but yeah, good hand. So you can see what we're kind of doing here. We're kind of just like picking the optimal lines against fish and playing against fish is not as easy and straightforward as people think. Although it's easier to profit against fish, that doesn't mean that there aren't still a lot of factors that go into our decision making against fish. Um, we fold 8-3 suited on the button there. That very much depends how fit or fold our big blind is on table 2. He seems yeah. to be like not super fit or fold, like a bit stationary, so I don't mind folding 8-3 there. It's maybe a bit weak, so I think that's fine. But against someone like Bad Luck on table 3 there, if he's in our big blind with a reg and a small, we should definitely open it. Um, yeah. So here we have 9s on table 3, and yeah, we just give up here, hopefully. This is a spot in the past where I think you would have not folded. I just want to like... You, you mean here on table four? Yeah, not the bottom certainly, pair. but it depends. If you were like a little bit absolutely, in death yeah. mode. Yeah, I absolutely would have called it there in the past, and now I just gave up. So, yeah, yeah for sure. Why is it bad to call there? Like, why, why did we learn that that would be a bad call? <sighs> I, I mean, I'm just I'm just getting crushed here. I mean, there's yeah. just... <laughs> between these guys, they can, you know, they're, this really hits them. You know, I'm way behind. I mean... Um, yeah, that's kind of simple, isn't it? There's not really too much to yeah. say. We're just, we're just like, we have the worst hand almost certainly, or not the best hand, and we only have like a few outs, if that. But, no, I should, but, but yeah, in the past, we might have ended up calling here and then showing down the worst hand at some point, and then the blue line's taking like a big hit, but now we're sort of like saving our blue line by like folding in all these different situations that we used to spew in. So yeah, that's definitely one of them. Yep. Good to point those out. Okay, good. It's always good to remind yourself as well of the progress that you've made by saying, I used to play that spot horribly and now I don't. I'm a much better player now. That's great for the confidence, great for the soul. Good to remind yourself of how far you've come. So here we're out of position with Kings. King 9 here on table 3, I'm definitely opening. Good. Yeah, you want to play like such a wide range on table 3, right, against bad luck because you can see bet so much. You just want to open absolutely everything. Um, Kings, we go only. 3x there, I might make that bigger. I mean, you've got a limper out of position. You kind of want to get it heads up, although it's not a big deal. But yeah, go bigger there. Your out position ISOs are still too small. Like if you're okay. really 3xing there, um, you definitely want to go like 4 or 5x out of position there. Okay, let's go back and look at the king's hand because I want to see exactly what went on. We'll just do these couple of hands, then we'll probably wrap up for today and we'll continue where we left off tomorrow. We're just going through this video, doing a sort of pick up where we left off idea. So let's go back and try and see the flop onwards. Okay, so here, let's just play from there and I'll just explain what I mean again. I want you to pause when we get to the flop though. So here we want to go at least $2. Like 3x is just too small. He's getting such a great price to like just call with crap and suck out on his. Of course, it's still plus EV to raise 3x here, but when you're at position, you need to go bigger here, and yeah, I think this is just a glitch. I think normally you do go bigger here. I don't know. Yeah, I usually do. I didn't want to scare him off. That's that's what I was thinking here specifically. So um, I guess it was a mistake. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he's probably not going to fall to like a four x as well. 
Um, be wary about that kind of don't want to scare him off logic because I mean the guy's 583. He's usually he's limp calling far more than he's limp folding. And you've got another guy there who's going to come along a lot as well. It's very rare you'll take this down pre-flop. And even if you do, it's not a disaster. It's better to build a bigger pot for the majority okay. of the time that you're going to get action here. So yeah, on flop we're going to bet big because we have the best hand a lot and he has so many draws and worse hands. 248 is not bad. Um, on this flush turn you should bet again. Like checking here is a mistake. It is? Yeah. Because when you check this turn, what are you doing? Are you check folding the turn? I'm not sure. I mean, right. um, I think that a, a flush draw is a big part of this guy's range. Um, it's some of his that's range a for point. sure, right? But he also has a load of queen x in his range, and it's easier to have queen x in this turn than it is to have a flush. You'll have more combinations of queen x. Kind of like as we looked at before, it's easier to have one pair than it is to have a flush. And this okay. guy, although he is going to be playing all the random diamonds... Remember, he's also going to be playing a load of bullshit Queen X hands, like Queen 8 offsuit plus Queen Deuce suited plus or something. All those hands are in his range, right? And okay. they're calling the turn. So we have a value bet on the turn, basically. He can okay. also have crappy hands like gut shots on the flop that are now just going to call again. He can have, like, okay. Jack 8. He can have, like, Jack 10, um, King Jack... Random shit, basically. So uh, on the turn, it would be a bet fold. Bet fold. If I, if I bet yeah. and uh, he raises, absolutely. I fold. Secret weapon against fish. We bet fold, right? Like we like we talked about before. We don't want to ever check call against a passive fish when we can bet fold because bet folding is just so much better. Um, and here we can value bet. It's not too thin. If this was like a four flush, it would be too thin, and we should just check fold probably. Which, which but, is the river. So that, right. So the four of the river is good to check fold. Um, but the turn is definitely still a value bet. And never check call the turn. Check calling the turn is way worse than bet folding because okay. while he's going to check back with all the Queen X bullshit, Queen X suited mm -hmm. like that, that's in his range, he's going to bet a, quite a strong range that you're just not going to be happy calling against. However, he'll call you with a weak range. So bet fold, bet okay. fold, bet fold. Okay, yeah. So I missed that bet there. He would have called that with that Queen 4. In sure. that situation, sure. But remember, think about his range as a whole. That's the most right, important right, right. thing. Okay. But yeah, that kind of has shown down there kind of proves my point that he has all the Queen X suited under the sun, as we expected. So yeah, definitely a turn bet there. Get into the habit more of bet folding a marginal value hand rather than auto-check deciding against these guys. Just bet fold is very key there. We men opened there? That's a bit weird. Table one. Um, trying to understand why. Um, I don't remember why specifically there. Who knows? So, sometimes, I'm, again, I'm not great at four tabling. I, I, yeah. Three is my usual. So sometimes when I've got hands, like I was, I was paying, probably paying attention to this. Yeah, uh, I think so. Two, Two pair flop here yep. on table two. I just hit the <laughs> yeah, and you make like a small technical mistake because obviously yeah, yeah. you want the three x there, right? Yeah, because you've got the fish. Yeah, okay. Let's look at this two pair hand. So this is just a limped pot, is it? Yeah. yeah, yeah. And we just lead the flop, did we? Let's go back. Okay. Yeah, I, I did. I, I led. Okay. Well, look at these two hands are going on here, and then we're definitely going to wrap up because we're going for ages. So we'll wrap up for today and resume. But we'll do these two hands. Yeah. So we check a standard. I think leading flop is good here again. Like you just can't trust these guys are going to like take a stab here because they're so passive by the looks of it. So definitely just leading and getting a call is good. With eight five suited, you don't even have to open there with two fish just because you might get through eight pot a lot and you don't necessarily want that. Um, yeah, it's just standard leading the turn again on table two. We have an open end straight draw in a limped pot. We need to raise pre there on table one against this guy. Like we're making another mistake there, I think, because we're in hands at the same time. Um, why do we need to raise pre flop when he limps our big blind in the small blind? Pause. I'm sorry. Table three. Bad luck. Okay. Uh, I was watching our, that hand. Yes. Yeah. Let's focus on this. I'm going to jump down there first just to really quickly cover that point. Bad luck limps our small blind, right? What do we say about this player type? What's our strategy? Against the spider guy. Um, I, I'm going to isolate and right. then see bet. Okay, so what do we do with 10-8 off? I should be isolating. Yep. I should be raising, right? Absolutely, and then see betting. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. Table, so yeah, this is what Joe was talking about earlier. There's a gap between what Joe understands in theory 
and the decision he makes with only a few seconds to act when for tabling, right? There's a yep. gap there. Of course there's going to be. And we bridge that gap by doing lots and lots of work off the tables and probably by not for tabling. It's good that you did it for the purposes of the video because it makes it a really good pace of review. I think three tables, just until we've incorporated all these concepts into your real time in-game thought process, is going to be a bit better. So one goal I'm going to give Joe in between this session and the next one is to play no more than three tables. And he's going to say, okay, cool, I'm going to do that. And that way I will transfer all of my out-of-game knowledge into in-game thought process, right? Okay. So that's one of Joe's goals for the next little while because um, he's just missed the spot there where I'm going to say, this is why I'm like, I'm harsh. I'm a horrible teacher. I'm like, you have missed so much EV there. Look at all the EV you've missed by checking your 10-8 offsuit. And it might not seem like a big deal, but it is because it's totally like contrary to the strategy we have. Uh, that's a start. good teacher. That's what I want. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> I want to know what I... Uh, this is why like, if you have like a vulnerable ego, you should think twice before hiring me as a coach because I'll probably just tell you you suck and then you'll hate me and that won't be a very good dynamic. And I'm friends with most of my students because they don't have that problem. But yeah, I think if you have ego problems, you shouldn't, you should sort those out before getting coaching because you won't get enough out of it if you're constantly like fighting with your teacher just out of pride. And Joe's one of my favorite students because he doesn't do that. He just says, yep, you're right, that was stupid. Let's fix it. And we fix a lot of stuff because of that. Anyway, let's jump. So that's Joe's goal now. He's not going to play so many tables at the same time. And he's going to just make sure he sticks to this strategy of isolating, of player typing and playing optimally like he can do out of game. Table two, jumping back up there for a second, we bet flop and turn. Should we bet river for value as well? Uh, yes. Yes, we should. Yeah, it's four to a straight, but 6x, is that a big part of this guy's range? I don't think so. No. What is a big part of his range? Um, I think maybe queen. Yeah. yeah. Queen x, absolutely. What else? Yeah. Um, he could be... Any sort of pocket pairs, yep. uh, broadways, aces, uh, ace, uh, you know, he could have ace seven, ace four. Yep, good, so a pair on the flop, yeah. basically, or a pocket pair is the right. biggest thing in his reign. So be a big mistake here. A lot of guys would say something like, oh, river goes four to a straight, I should check my two pair because my relative hand strength has decreased. That's true. Your relative hand strength in relation to the board has decreased, but against your opponent's range, you're still crushing. You should value bet. What size should we value bet here, do you think? Um, half to three quarters. Yeah, I think that's decent. Whereabouts in there? That's a little bit too big for me. Half and three quarters are very different sizes here. All right, seven. Seven is big, yeah. Seven's probably quite good because I think he's still going to call Queen X to seven. Yeah. Okay. I, think I forget should, what I actually did here. I think we should max value here. Go about 650 to seven. I think that's good. Just get called by top pair. Maybe get called. He has like worst two pair here as well. He has like four, five and seven, five in his range. That's never folding. Four, three, that kind uh. of shit. I checked. Oh, oh, see, this is what I mean. Two tables. That's it. Two tables. <laughs> oh, wow. Wow. Okay. Yeah, I would probably not call the river. Really? Okay. So I made two mistakes. So it's a it's a bet fold. And... It's a bet fold, yeah. Um, because this guy's like so uber passive that when he just like, he bets, how big is his sizing here? Look at this guy's sizing. He bets, I think, 14. And you snap call. Like you've got some soul read that he's bluffing. I don't know. Maybe you did have a read there, but we snap call really quickly. Um, yeah, that was the bad hand of the session. Yeah, uh, but you know, I don't know. I mean, it's it could be. I, I think a lot of these fish, they're they're playing like some sort of draw. Again, maybe this is being the whole vendetta thing, and then they totally miss on the river, and they s throw a bluff in, and then I'm going to bluff catch. That's how I've been actually. What draw totally misses on this river? You're, you're right. No flush draw misses because there was no flush draw. Um, uh, you know, he's he's got what? No, the, the, the straights get there. Yep. Um, so, yeah, big bet on me. Yeah, so there aren't any missed draws. So that's where we need to be careful because we can't bluff catch against missed draws when there aren't really any missed draws. Um, so I think I would just give this guy credit for an extremely strong range and like fold this river with two pair here. Because um, all he needs to have is like a random six, like seven six, four six, queen six here to have what he thinks is the nut. So he does actually have a bunch of value here. So I would, when it's four to a straight here, we just have to fold to this bet. But we have to bet because like most of his range is queen x. And one leak that we've seen twice already in this video is that you are check checking spots that you should be bet folding too much, right? Where you okay. have a, you have a value hand, but it's not super super strong. 
It's just a value hand that's great against the fish's calling range, but not great against the fish's overbetting the pot range, because the two are totally different, right? He's calling yeah. your river bet with all kinds of top pair, but he's not betting 14 with the like, queen jack ever, probably. So that's why it's so much better to be betting here than it is to be checking and deciding. But I think that four tabling is definitely... Like, you can still beat these games four tabling, but you will make a lot more mistakes and it'll hurt your win rate. So I think we two or three table for now for sure and then work okay. up to it. And we take a lot of care to make sure that we are bet folding marginal value hands against these fish rather than check doing anything. Unless we have a read that they are spewy and spazzy and love to shovel money into the pot with a bluff. And remember, they need to be able to have a bluff as well. And board texture is going to be important for that because here there's not really so much air he can have. So his range gets weighted more towards 6x. Okay. All right, so we're going to wrap up there and Joe's goals are, what I do at the end of the session is I'll say to my student, what are your goals? So Joe, what are your goals? Well, i got to drop down to tables. I'll, I'll three table um, instead of four. Uh, it's reverse. I was actually trying to start increasing tables, but uh, I could see that, that I'm not making clear enough decisions no. um, You know, with, with the four tables. So um, I'll go down to three tables, and I'm going to really look to bet in spots where I'm, I'm checking right now and mm -hmm. using the bet fold. Uh, um, as opposed to check call. Yep. And what kind of hand is it that we're going to be bet folding mostly against these fish? What strength of hand? Um, top pair. Yep. I mean, uh, good hand, not great hand. You know, Excellent. not a, a non-nut uh, value hand, right? Yep. And why am I checking that? Because I'm being careful. I'm making sure that Joe's not taken from that that he should just bet fold all kinds of random air. No, of course not. We don't want to bluff against fish in the later streets making sure that he knows, like he does know, that we're talking about marginal value hands. So that's why I'm kind of like trying to elicit that that back. Um, so yeah, that's what I'll do at the end of the session. I'll say, okay, these are your, what are your goals? He tells me his goals. I say, good, those are your goals. Um, go do them. And then, yeah, the next session, we're going to pick up where we left off. And I'm going to say, how are your goals? What are your goals, Joe? And he'll say, my goals were these. And I'll say, how are they going? And he'll hopefully say, good. Or if not so good, then we'll talk about why. And we'll we've now fixed we fixed the way he plays a lot of spots, but now we've encountered a new error that is he's not bet folding enough and he's checking too much. And now we're going to fix that because that is now the most important thing to fix. It wasn't before because first we had to fix that big pot spew, right? That was far worse before. But now mm -hmm. we fixed that. We're looking at the next worst error that's left. And I think it's not bet folding enough. So we're going to become bet fold machines over the next few days. Then we're going to come back and record another video and we're going to see how Joe's doing with that. So we have directed learning in between sessions and we have like progress here. And that's, that's how we get better at poker. We don't get better at poker just by sitting down and looking at spots and vacuums and saying, bet fold this spot. We get better by setting goals and making sure the learning is really directed. So you will see a lot of that in this series and it should be good. And by the end of it, um, yeah, Joe should be playing a lot more solidly in these games and making that blue line even better and making the red line more stable. So that's our aim. All right. So I think we'll wrap up for today, man, yeah? And we'll come back. We'll come back soon with episode two. Okay, awesome. Cool. Um, all right, so let me go back to my cartoon because it's, you must understand it's traditional for me to finish on my cartoon and start <laughs> on my cartoon. I don't know why. So this has been Whack a Fish. I hope you guys have enjoyed it. Um, lots more to come of how to optimize against fish. Please leave us your comments or questions, I'm sure. You'd be happy, wouldn't you, Joe, to discuss the way you play hands with the guys on Grinder School and get involved there as well, right? You remember? Sure. Yep. Cool. So get in touch with us. Let us know what you think. And if you've got any specific formats, this is like the longest video ever, by the way. It's like an hour and 15, but there's a treat for you guys. If you've got any formats that you want to suggest to us, then please do that. And we're happy to give them a go for you. Okay. So see you on the... On the next one, bye for now.